Chapter 18 It took me only a minute to realize that something was wrong. This was no joyous homecoming. There was an underlying sense of fear and confusion in the bustle. People stood well clear of a carriage, a three-dome rut with a powerful team of bullocks, hot and exhausted, harnessed to it and masked men carefully bore a litter from it to the open gates of the Haveli. It wasn't apparent if the person they carried was dead or alive. If the mask raised fears, the red flag hoisted from the high roof of the Haveli to the surprise and confusion of the crowd below confirmed it. It was the warning flag, the flag that by law every household must fly to warn the crowd, the town that its members had a case of the deadly disease the smallpox. Not Rahul, I prayed. Merciful goddess, not Rahul. Who is sick? I asked. Please, can someone tell me who it is? It was no use asking, for the crowd didn't know. They stood grim and silent, watching the spectacle. But the carriage driver jumped off his place behind the tired-looking bullocks and spoke up. It's the mistress. We were two days' journey away from a journey when she was taken sick. I drove through the night to get her here as soon as possible. My beasts are spent, and I don't know if we reached in time. I laid a hand on the sweaty brow of one of the bullocks. They needed a rub down and a long rest after being unhitched. Have you had the tikka? I asked him. He nodded. The whole party had it by God's grace, except for the poor mistress, of course. I remembered that she had not approved of the tikka the day we had visited they had visited us in the village. Has the Ved been sent for? I asked. I don't know, he said, leading the tired oxen towards the stables at the back of the Haveli. It is difficult to find anyone who's willing to treat the disease, you know. I did know. Amma was one of the few healers in the city who would treat a person with smallpox. Most people didn't want to be anywhere near it, and who could blame them, with the disease being as contagious as it was? Hoofbeat signaled an incoming horseman riding hard. Could it be Rahul? No. I recognized the gray hair and heavy build as the stallion pulled up. It was the Nagar Seth. He must have been behind the Sethani's party, but he would have made up the distance between them as soon as he got the news about his wife. Where is Padma? he asked the male steward. I realized that Padma was the Sethani's name. I had never heard him speak her name out loud before. Respectable men did not utter their wife's name in public, but this was not the time for social niceties. The crowd was dispersing. Some of the servants, too, were walking away with them. I'd seen it happen before. Servants, even family members, abandoning the diseased, leaving them to die alone. From the side door, I saw a group of women leave. The Nagar said saw, th saw them, too. Ten bags of gold coins for anyone who stays and helps nurse the mistress, he declared in a caring voice. Most of the women kept walking, but an old maid with pockmarks on her face that indicated she had survived the disease before turned around. His shoulders slumped with relief. Go to your mistress and try and make her comfortable, he ordered. It'll not be easy, master, she said. She's burning up with fever and the rashes are everywhere the size of lentils. I winced at her description. The Nagar said clutched at her arm. Can anything be done? I'm a maid, not a healer, the, wo the woman said. I don't know how to treat her. I stepped forward. You must use cold compresses to bring her fever down and give her a tonic of neem oil, I said, unable to stop myself. Oh, and apply a paste of turmeric, gram flour, and milk to soothe and disinfect the rashes, then wash it off with water infused with neem leaves. Leela. The Nagar said, said, hope returning to his voice as he recognized me. Will your mother come to her? I shook my head. Amma has gone to visit the temple of Amba Devi at Mandu. She won't return for four days. Is there anyone else capable of treating her before that, he asked. I don't think so, I, I said. The Nagar said looked old and beaten. I have already lost a wife. I cannot bear to go through this again. I remembered what Brinda had said about the lost fleet. He had not hesitated to offer gold to anyone, to anyone willing to nurse the Setani. Was it the last bit of gold they had? A Brahmin's curse is potent, child. Ajee's word came back to me suddenly. 
It was I myself who had once wished the pox upon her. If you give me permission, I said, I will treat your wife. You, the Nagar Sage was astonished. No, you are so young. I cannot let you risk your health. I am trained in Ayurveda, I said. I have learned by my mother's side ever since I could walk, and I have had the tikka every year since I was a child. I believe myself immune. Amma would have treated your wife, and I know Baba will not stop me. Time is of the essence if you wish to save her. Grant me access and a pair of hands to make the medicine she needs. He hesitated, but only for a moment. Come, he said, flinging the door open. I will send word to your Baba. Every limb and muscle in my body throbbed with pain. I had been prepared for vigilance and care, but not for the sheer physical effort of nursing a desperately sick woman. I had only nursed children like Loki and my younger cousins before and had no experience nursing a full-grown woman. The house was deserted. No one would help us for fear of the disease, so everything had to be done by the pair of us. The old woman didn't have the strength for many of the tasks we had to perform, drawing water from the well, tending the fire to boil the neem leaf infusion, cooking a simple meal to keep our strength, lifting the fever-racked frame of the setani so that we could apply the poultice and the coal compasses she needed. It was hard physical labor of the kind I wasn't used to. The bitter smell, the bitter smell of neem leaves was everywhere. We burned neem leaves to purify the air and boiled a vat of water with neem leaves to bathe the round pustle rashes that had appeared all over the Satani's body. We had to co work constantly to keep her fever down. Cold water from the basement well had to be drawn for the cold compasses for her forehead. I mixed a paste of turmeric, sandalwood, gram flour and other cooling ingredients to soothe the irritation from her rashes. We applied it carefully on the setani and held her hands down to stop her from scratching and infecting the soles. Can you hear me? I asked her gently. You must not scratch the pox or it'll get putrid. She could not speak, but her eyes showed a flash of recognition. She held her hand still. For the first time we felt we had a chance. Our patient could hear us and follow our commands. Worse than the exhaustion was the struggle to keep my wits about me and not lose my good judgment to weariness and worry. It was hard to look on this disease without fear and revulsion. The pustule-filled pox had transformed the Satani's body into something of a nightmare. But though I didn't, did not think at first that I could, somewhere within me I found Amma's clear-eyed focus and resolve. The old maid and I fell into a silent rhythm taking turns to feed, sponge, and watch over the setani in the days and nights that followed. A week later, or less perhaps, I don't know for sure, I woke up to the terrace of the Haveli and looked at the city spread below. What I saw filled me with dread. There were red flags on nearly two dozen buildings, three in the Brahman Pela, our own neighborhood. The markets were quiet, the town deserted, funeral pies burnt on the banks of the Shipra. Loki's face flashed before my eyes. No, he would be fine. Amma had made sure he had the tikka and she would be home by now. That must be why Baba and Amma had not come for me. The entire city had been infected and they were needed elsewhere. The next day, as I dozed by the Sitani side, she sat up by herself and opened her eyes and spoke. Milavati, she said, soft but clear. She knew it was me. I nearly cried when I heard her speak. She had suffered our ministrations without complaint, though she must have been in agony. Amma always said that you could tell much about a person by the way they bear pain and illness. The Satani had courage and patience and fortitude. How wrong I had been in my shallow dislike of her. This was a turning point. After that, it was slow. It was a slow but steady recovery. No longer a fight between life and death. And we had another ally by our side, the Setani herself. The part of the Haveli where her apartment was located had been quarantined off from the rest of the house so the disease would not spread. Slowly as news of the Setani's recovery spread, the servants returned and our work became easier. When Amma finally came to see me, she was equal parts furious and proud. 
the teacher is not infallible foolish child you could have had you have had some protection but you may yet get the disease since you've already been exposed to it and the damage is now done you may as well stay it is not as if the rest of the city is safe i learned of the other outbreaks in the city from her she was much needed there so she had let me continue to nurse the sitani but she had found other maids who had survived the disease so now we had extra hands to help with the actual nursing it was nearly a week before before the sitani could leave her bed it felt longer because of the health we now had i did not have much to occupy my time i missed my usual routine of studying and teaching instead i spent my time practicing my singing since there was nothing else to do in the apartment isolated as we were from the rest of the world i was in the middle of one of the songs nishikanji had been teaching us when i realized that the sitani was on her feet listening as i sang i stopped and turned to look at her beautiful she said softly her voice still weak you have a singular voice you look better i said gently i was used to her now the awkwardness between us had long vanished thanks to you she said humbly you have taken good care of me leela i had done it for rahul and for the nagar sake you must send for your clothes she said and anything else you need it seems we are to be confined here for some time the old feeling of inadequacy made me conscious of the tired cotton sari that hung limply around me i raised my chin these are my clothes the sit honey was quiet i did not say anything about the grant money that the nagar state had been tardy with i remembered what brinda had said about the pirates and the lost fleet but i also remembered the bag of gold that the nagar state had offered the old maid a week ago how different our circumstances were difficult times for us meant there was no sugar to make rice pudding for loki or new clothes to replace torn ones for me difficult times for them and they had to choose between giving gold to the temple they were constructing in ujjaini or giving gold to baba's observatory i know the funds we had promised the observatory have not been forthcoming the sitani said as if hearing my thoughts they had been downturns in our business and liquidity issues which have forced us to hold back our endowment promises i have always respected the acharya's dedication to education respect wouldn't buy back the jewelry and household items i might have to sell off to put food on the table there is no need for explanations i said trying hard not to let my indignation on baba's behalf show in my voice and was there need to stay and nurse me she asked i didn't do it for gain i said no more reason for me to be in your debt she said things have been difficult and they continue to be so but there are promises made by the nagar state that need honoring we may not be able to remit the full amount promised immediately but we can make a start thank you was all i could think of to say she waved it off it's nothing but an investment for the future half our accountants come from your baba's school that much was true I'm sorry you've been cooped up here with me. It must be so tedious for a young girl like you. I've been keeping busy. I reassured her. My teacher says I need to practice my singing, but I missed my class. And Baba needed help with the new book on arithmetic. I remember that you teach now. She said, "Why don't you test my knowledge of Ganit? It'll keep our minds active." All right, I said. Would you like to solve a verse from Baba's book on math? Certainly, she said. A traveler engaged in pilgrimage as started gave half his money at Prayag, two thirds of the remainder at Kasi, at Kashi, a quarter of the residue in payment of taxes on the road, six tenths of what was left at Gaya, and there remained sixty three nishkas with which he returned home. Tell me the amount of his original stock of money. She listened carefully. A clever riddle, she said. It took her a minute, but she worked it out. Would you like to try another? She was an intelligent woman. I had to admit, even her voice didn't sound so nasal anymore. The scabs over the pox scars were starting to peel. The neem and fuse paste I'd applied on it must have stung, but the sitani took her treatment with her usual fortitude. But she looked at her scarred reflection with sad resignation. I was never pretty, she said, and now these scars have ruined whatever appeal I possessed. she was wrong her personality was like a force of nature 
it would take more than a few scars to dent it. Perhaps it was the isolation, but you opened up to me in other ways. It's not easy to try and fill the shoes of a much-loved wife and mother. It's not easy to compete with a bro, she said one day. I compensated by managing my husband's business, at least there I was useful. More than useful, from what I'd heard. I'm married too late to have children of my own, and it was not easy for Rahul to accept me. I was never much good with young children, but now that he's grown, we understand each other better. For that, I'm grateful. It touched me to hear her speak with such affection of Rahul, but it was also uncomfortable to be her confidant when she spoke of him. But since she was determined to unburden herself, I kept quiet and listened. It was a mistake to rush into the betrothal with Rupmati as soon as he returned, she said. It made sense from a business perspective, our family's own complementary interests. And I thought if he married a local girl, it was less likely he would go back to Java. So that was why Rahul had been betrothed in such a hurry. He's not happy with the engagement, though I can find no fault with the girl. But it's so difficult to retract a promise once given, especially since the Oswals have been so good to us during our time of need. Rahul then had still not come to terms with his betrothal. You've known Rahul since childhood, have you not? He spent two years in Ojeni, didn't he? She frowned a little. I really don't understand why he avoids coming here. He avoids coming here. The words hurt, hurt physically like a blow to the stomach. The floor tilted unnaturally in a slow way and I took a hasty step to regain my balance. I felt sick. It couldn't be. I raised a trembling hand to my face. What is it? the Satani asked, rushing to me. Beneath my fingers, I felt a small raised bump. I had the pox. Amma came immediately. She handled it well, although she must have felt anxious. It isn't uncommon, she said, to have a reoccurrence. Your body has been weakened with all the demands you made on it. You need rest, sleep, nurturing. With luck, it'll be mild and easily treated. They say Tani was beside herself with the moors. If there is one mark on her because of this, I will never forgive myself. Her face, her beautiful face. Oh, it is my fault.